Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. In March, Takahiro Mori, a senior executive at Japan's largest steelmaker, hopped on a flight from Tokyo to Pittsburgh. He'd come all the way to the altar of the steelworkers, you know, this hallowed ground of the American labor movement, of the American steel industry. Josh Wingrove covered the fallout from the visit for Bloomberg News. And he says Mori flew all that way to clinch a big deal. His company, Nippon Steel, wanted to acquire U.S. Steel Corporation, which was once the largest company in the world. Really, it was an olive branch. He's trying to convince the union leader to get on board. On the other side of the table was Dave McCall, the head of the powerful United Steelworkers Union. In corporate takeovers, unions don't always hold much sway. But due to a combination of timing, circumstance, and politics, in this deal, they do. Dave McCall and his team sat in silence. That's Joe Doe. He covers metals and mining for Bloomberg News. You send one of your highest-ranking executives of a top-five global steelmaker... 15 hours to the United States, and there's an expectation that a substantial conversation will occur. But that is not what happened. A lot of people thought this landmark deal was a corporate slam dunk, but talks fell apart in less than an hour. The future of the deal is now uncertain, in part because it's happening in the crucible of a presidential election. The issue is the politics, and the politics is the union. And now there are huge consequences for President Biden, former President Trump, and the entire American steel industry. Today on the show, what this fraught U.S. steel deal tells us about American manufacturing and union politics and what it could mean for Joe Biden and Donald Trump. This is The Big Take Podcast from Bloomberg News. I'm David Gura. This is not your run-of-the-mill corporate deal, because U.S. Steel is not just any company. It was the world's largest company. That's Joe Doe, a Bloomberg Metals reporter. U.S. Steel was forged in 1901 by a few names you may have heard before. Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and Charles Schwab. The metal it's made is a part of the United Nations building, the New Orleans Superdome, and the Chicago Picasso sculpture. But its metal is used for more than just landmarks. Steel is ubiquitous. It is in everything. Steel has kept pace with and anticipated the increasing needs of the nation. Steel is in the roads. It's in your refrigerator houses. Like, it's everywhere. In any giant ladle of molten metal, there may be steel that is destined to defeat time and distance, to provide the framework of mighty buildings. And so this was a company that at one point, when we were a manufacturing-based economy, was absolutely central to everything. It was also part of the war machine. World War I, World War II. The tool that in our hands means victory, and our hands must be as relentless as the hands of our clocks. It employed a lot of people, but automation came around in the 70s and 80s, and people started to lose their jobs. And, and talk to any of these steel workers, and they will tell you, yeah, I remember when they brought a continuous caster into the plant and that was fully automated and we instantly lost a lot of jobs, a lot of people who worked in the mills and the furnaces for ages were no longer needed. Automation hit U.S. steel particularly hard. The company was slow to adopt new, more efficient technology. Plus, in the last few decades, other countries like China have doubled down on steel production and they've undercut the U.S. on prices. Joe says U.S. Steel's approach put it at a competitive disadvantage. These old blast furnace mills that have been around since the day of Andrew Carnegie, they're slower. You can't turn them on and off. You can't flip a switch. If you want to bring them down, there's a massive process behind that. And pretty soon, U.S. Steel fell behind. By 2015, the company was posting losses of more than a billion dollars a year. And in 2020, U.S. Steel's CEO made a bold move. He spent a lot of money on one of those new higher-tech plants, the kind of company can scale up or down quickly, and uses a process that doesn't pollute as much. He paid a premium for it. And I remember at the time when he bought it, many people in the steel industry, they'd laugh. They, they said, I cannot believe how much they overpaid for this mill. But at its core, what all these people said was, It's kind of their only option, because if not, you're still talking about a company slowly marching toward its doom. That big bet paid off. 
That mill became the crown jewel of U.S. steel. It was a boon to its bottom line. But it also introduced a new problem. Workers at that new higher-tech plant weren't unionized, which posed a threat to workers in those old-school mills who are members of the United Steelworkers Union, or the USW. Non-unionized labor at profitable U.S. steel plants weakened the union's bargaining power. Those USW workers are the people Dave McCall was representing at that tense meeting with Nippon Steel, the company that wants to buy U.S. Steel. Now, at the time of that meeting, even though U.S. Steel had managed to pull itself out of the red, thanks in part to its decision to purchase that state-of-the-art mill, it still had long-term capital concerns, which made it interested in a merger. Nippon Steel announced its bid in December. It offered to invest over a billion dollars in the company and promised it would not idle plants or have any immediate layoffs. That announcement came out at 6 in the morning. I spoke to Dave McCall just before 6.30 a.m. Wow. And you could sense a bit of surprise in his voice. I think anybody could say, yeah, if you work at a company and you find out some company you've never heard of maybe is, is going to buy your company, you might also just have questions like, what does that you know, mean for me or my job? Uh, and, and that is like one of the things that we've heard from not just Dave McCall, but the steelworkers themselves, right? One of those workers is Rob Hutchison. He's been a USW member for the last 28 years. Joe recently caught up with him in Pittsburgh. Of course, everybody's worried about their job, their future, their community, the iconic name of U.S. still being lost. Hutchison told Joe this isn't just about being blindsided by the news that their company is being sold and sold to an international company they didn't even know was bidding. He's also concerned about security, security he and other workers don't believe they'd get with this current offer. What kind of investments is Nippon actually going to make? Are they going to live up to their their promises, uh, which have been pretty vague at this point? It's not just saying you're going to invest $1.4 billion. It is, of that $1.4 billion, we're going to invest X number of millions of dollars to the mills that are unionized work. You need some assurances that go beyond just save half of the mills. Right now, there's sort of like two sides of the coin to U.S. steel. White House reporter Josh Wingrove. One is this new, modern, more efficient plant, the crown jewel. And the others are the older, more hallowed, unionized blast furnaces that have a lot more political clout. For Maury, that crown jewel is what his company wants. But he can't get his hands on it without the backing of the union, which represents the other part of the company. To a lot of people, this deal is a no-brainer. It is a sale to an allied country's company. A lot of people thought this would sail through, including, it seems, the buyer. But McCall and the union rejected the deal, in part because the bid didn't specify which jobs Nippon Steel would keep, whether the deal would protect union work. McCall also said Nippon Steel should have consulted the USW sooner, but the union had been backing a rival bid from an American company. Nippon Steel said it couldn't rope the union in to its own bid. It would be showing its hand to an ally of a competitor. The union walked out politely. They didn't like storm out, but the union wasn't satisfied. U.S. Steel and Nippon Steel gave Bloomberg a joint statement, which said, in part, we are confident that our partnership will protect and grow U.S. Steel. The deal will protect jobs, strengthen American supply chains, and enhance the competitiveness of the U.S. economy, all while building resilience against threats from China. U.S. Steel's headquarters will remain in Pittsburgh, and its products, supported by significant capital investments and technology sharing from Nippon Steel, will remain mined, melted, and made in America. One week after the meeting, President Biden released his own statement, which was pretty extraordinary. They called explicitly for U.S. Steel to be American-owned and American-run. It went farther than a lot of people thought it would. Essentially, because the union opposed the deal, President Biden did too. A president weighing in on a deal in the first place is huge. And then weighing in on like a steel deal is like next level. Why Joe Biden weighed in on a steel deal at all, what his support of the union means for the future of U.S. steel, and how all this could figure into the 2024 election after the break. We're back. After the head of the United Steelworkers Union rejected Nippon Steel's offer to take over U.S. Steel, President Biden stepped in to say he had the union's back. 
Here's Josh Wingrove on why. Joe Biden has spent the last four years courting unions. Biden is from Scranton, Pennsylvania. His dad moved their family to Claymont, Delaware, just outside of Philadelphia. The steel industry, Pennsylvania's steel industry, union jobs. I mean, this colors every speech this guy gives. It is the entire lens of Joe Biden and his view on the economy. In a sense, it's not surprising President Biden would weigh in on this deal, that he would throw his support behind the USW, even if presidents are largely reluctant to weigh in on corporate takeovers. And his decision to back the union paid off. Within a few weeks, the United Steelworkers Union endorsed Biden's re-election campaign. The union leadership are essentially unanimous. The question is, will their members follow them? Quite clearly, a lot of union members like Donald Trump. That's because while Biden has branded himself as Union Joe, it's impossible to talk about U.S. manufacturing's rise to prominence without talking about Donald Trump. With his Make America Great Again slogan, Trump is appealing to nostalgia for a time when American manufacturing reigned supreme, U.S. Steel's golden era. When he ran for president in 2016, Trump said he would prop up the struggling U.S. steel industry. These are blue-collar workers. Trump is speaking to them. And he flipped a lot of these important states in 2016 by speaking to them. Two years later, as president, he made good on that promise. Trump imposed a 25 percent tariff on steel imports, which was a radical move. The tariffs caused a mess. Everyone, including allied countries, lost their minds over that. But they were successful in reshaping the domestic steel industry. And right now, those tariffs remain in place because there's bipartisan agreement on them. Democrats and Republicans think they work. Which brings us back to Union Joe and his own nostalgia-based tagline, Build Back Better. The steel industry is one of very few issues where there is common ground among Republicans and Democrats. On the issue of protecting steel, Trump and Biden are very close together. I mean, it's difficult to distinguish their policies. The direction is one way on this. And that is more protectionism for the American steel industry. And keeping U.S. steel American-owned has important symbolism, which makes a Japanese takeover of U.S. steel in 2024 very tricky. Because what might be best for U.S. steel corporations' bottom line, being bought out by a Japanese company, is not what its union wants or what either leading presidential candidate wants. The question has shifted a little bit from who should own U.S. steel to What's the best outcome for the United Steel workers? Both Biden and Trump have spoken out against this deal. But Josh Wingrove says that raises another question neither candidate has answered. What would be a better option? There are a few different ways this could go. One, the deal does not happen and U.S. Steel remains independent. But that might mean the company runs short of capital and workers could still end up losing their jobs. Option two, the takeover does happen, but then the union won't be happy. Option three, U.S. Steel gets bought by another company or a combination of other companies. But the other highest bidder, the one backed by the union, is another U.S. steelmaker named Cleveland Cliffs. Cleveland Cliffs' bid would likely be lower, and it would give the company a monopoly over domestic iron ore reserves and a dominant share of coveted automotive steel. Then you create antitrust concerns. And if I was ranking the top two things that Joe Biden focuses on... (laughs) in managing the economy. It's probably unions and anti-monopoly efforts. It's unclear where this deal goes from here. Even if it does go through, it could get tied up in legal and regulatory maneuverings, including by President Biden, whose administration is reviewing the deal to confirm there are no security concerns from this foreign investment in a U.S. company. Joe Biden almost certainly cannot win the presidency again if he loses Pennsylvania. There are a lot of swing states, but this is, for him, crucial. It is a big state. It has a lot of electoral college votes. It's his home state. Demographically, if he loses Pennsylvania, he's probably losing. Similarly, for Trump, if he can steal away Pennsylvania, his odds of winning go through the roof. So Pennsylvania is the ballgame in some ways. And that's why we're seeing such focus on this. So Josh thinks it's likely a decision on the deal just slides until after the election. It's really messy. It's just a no-win situation. And the administration has a lot of leeway to stop, start, you know, pause the clock, review this, review that. They can really delay things. 
But slowing down this deal is also risky. Because if it collapses, that might not be good for U.S. steel. and It might not be good for the steel workers. And if it's bad for the steel workers, then all the politics that are hanging over this deal flare up again. And the question will be, who helped kill this deal and why? If people eventually blame whatever is about to happen for them losing a shift or losing a job or closing a plant. Thanks for listening to the Big Take podcast from Bloomberg News. I'm David Gura. This episode was produced by Julia Press. It was mixed by Ben O'Brien. It was fact-checked by Adriana Tapia Zafra. Naomi Shaven is our senior producer. It was edited by Aaron Edwards, Millie Moonshi, and Michael Shepard, who provides editorial direction with Wendy Benjaminson and Elizabeth Ponso. Nicole Beamsterboer is our executive producer. Sage Bauman is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. <laughs> 